them to, to further ones, depending upon how things go and what the interest is out there from the people attending and watching. Today, we're talking about strength. About a month from now, on March the 24th, we'll be talking about power. And then on April 21st, we're going to be talking about endurance. And the reason for doing this, if we tried to combine this into one presentation, because athletes and non-athletes, when we're talking about function, muscles function with all three components. But if we try to tie everything together, it would be almost a day-long sort of seminar, or at least an afternoon-long sort of seminar. So the thought is, let's break it up into components, and then at the very end, put those components together. Because depending upon the type of athlete that you are, or depending upon the type of injury that you've had, there may be some factors of strength that are going to be more important for you versus someone who may need more of a power component and someone who may, may need a little bit more of an endurance component. So we're going to try to keep things as practical and as user-friendly as possible. The real objectives today would be, if nothing else, to answer the question, what really is muscle strength? We use the term strength out there very loosely, very generically, and it's not that we're, we're going to try to turn you into exercise physiologists, but it's important to realize what we mean when we really talk about strength, because sometimes the, use, the word strength is used interchangeably with power or endurance or some other sorts of things that really don't apply. And as an athlete is trying to improve their performance or as an injured individual is trying to get back to normal performance, the real knowledge of what strength is and how it's developed becomes very, very important. We also wanna be able to differentiate between training for strength and rehabilitation for strength. What an athlete does to get stronger to enhance their performance may be quite different from what an injured individual needs to do to get back to normal strength. So training for strength means essentially starting at essentially a normal level and then improving that level. Whereas rehabilitation for strength means you started an area of disability or impairment or injury and get back to normal uh, function. And there, is an, there are important differences when we talk about strength training for these two different aspects. And then finally, the learning objective today is to hopefully impart understanding of the basic components of an exercise program to improve strength. Now, it's, probably, it's not going to be possible with the attendees to give everyone an individualized strength program through this webinar, but it should be possible to give you the components that you can work on yourself and then maybe bounce off a, a strengthening professional, a physical therapist, your physician, or your trainer to help you design a program that will help you meet your individual specific needs. So these are the objectives today and hopefully we'll be able to accomplish them. Okay, let's get, get into things a little bit more here. So to begin with, when we say muscle strength, what are we talking about? The premise is, okay, someone's out there, they've got a big muscle, therefore they're stronger. Well, the size of a muscle doesn't necessarily mean it's strong. You can have a large muscle, but if you've got an underlying metabolic problem, that size of that muscle may be from an artificial hypertrophy or enlargement of the muscle, which is really a pathological condition as opposed to true muscle strength. Muscle strength is the ability of a muscle to produce force. A stronger muscle produces more force than a weaker muscle. And this is regardless of the muscle that we're talking about. Now, as a little bit of a sidebar, people may remember from high school biology, or if you had to take a human uh, health class at some point in time, there are actually three different types of muscle, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. For our purposes here, we're talking about basically uh, striated muscle, the muscles that we use for the limbs. We're not talking about smooth muscle. 
for, which is involved in some of the intestinal tract and some other sorts of the internal systems of the body. And we're not talking about cardiac muscle. We are talking about basically the muscles that we use to move our joints, to do our things, to lift our loads and to play our sports. So strength is the ability of a muscle to produce force. It can also be thought of, of as the capacity of a muscle to perform work. If I can do more work than another person, I am stronger than that other person. If my muscles can produce more force than another person, I am stronger than that other person. So muscle strength is basically a relative sort of thing. There's really no zero point of muscle strength unless someone is a cadaver. So if we want to uh, look back in terms of the scientific things of physics, and I have on here, yikes, oh my goodness, because you're either really into physics or you're not, and most of us endured it to try to get to our professional standing. But to review just a little bit, force itself is mass times acceleration. So if a muscle is able to move a larger mass at a faster acceleration, therefore more force is produced, therefore it is stronger, okay? The other way to think about it is work. Work is basically the force applied over distance. So if you are able to produce more force over a longer distance, you have produced more work and therefore you are stronger. Now these are simplifications. We could spend the rest of the afternoon looking at the nuances of this, but for our purposes, this is basically what we want to try to do to, to define muscle strength as opposed to power, as opposed to endurance. And we'll make those differentiations for those other uh, webinars in March and in April. Okay, let's move forward just a little bit here. If the slide advances. Okay, more practically, why is strength important? It's not just a matter of trying to get bigger muscles or stronger muscles. Strength has real world importance. And not just for athletes who are trying to improve their performance or help their team win games or things of that regard. Muscle strength is important for everyone because with increased strength, it's been shown definitively, overall the human body becomes more efficient. It becomes a more efficient, healthier entity. It becomes better for physical activities and healthier, more efficient. It uses nutrients more efficiently. It has more resistance to disease and injury. So strengthening is important to help people stay healthy, live longer lives, have lesser degree of limitations, and simply basically be a better human being from at least a functional standpoint. So everyone can benefit from some degree of strength training, but that doesn't mean that everyone needs to look like an Olympic weightlifter or a bodybuilder or something like that. That's not what we're getting at. But anyone who does anything, walking, sitting, driving a car, texting, doing something on, on a computer, let alone lifting, carrying, or running, or playing racket sports could benefit from some degree of strength, simply for injury prevent, prevention and for health promotion. So how does a muscle get stronger? Now, this is an interesting standpoint, at least, you know, I hesitate to say this, but if you're from a you know, physiology standpoint, this is somewhat interesting. You may find this absolutely boring, but please realize there's more than one way, or actually there are two different ways, two different systems that work in combination to help a muscle become stronger. One method is muscle hypertrophy, which means basically the muscle gets bigger. And we'll talk about each one of these in um, comparison. The other way is neurologic adaptation. And this is sometimes overlooked because we're so used to thinking of, okay, the person has bigger 
muscles, therefore they are stronger. Well, that could be the case, but you could have someone with smaller muscles, but if they have better neurologic adaptation for function, they may be just as strong as someone who has a bigger muscle. So it's two parts. It's the size of the muscle and the way the body's neurologic system works in terms of reflexes and things called motor neurons and action potentials and those composites that basically work together in terms of how the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral muscles function. So let's take a look in greater detail of some of these sorts of things as a comparison standpoint. Muscle hypertrophy means, as I mentioned, an increase in the size of the muscle. In general, if it's healthy, a larger muscle will be stronger. It also gets hypertrophy by increasing what's known as a number of motor units. A motor unit are those fibers within a muscle that are activated by a peripheral nerve. So basically, strength training helps promote increased size of the muscle. It also helps promote an increased number of motor units. Think of this as cylinders in a car engine. In general, an eight-cylinder engine tends to be stronger than a four-cylinder engine. That's a very loose analogy, but in using this sort of uh, situation to comparison or at least to describe it, muscle hypertrophy strength training helps give you a bigger engine in terms of your muscle ca uh, capability and capacity. The body adapts. The body adapts by increasing the size of the muscle, increasing the number of motor units so that the muscle becomes more capable of producing force, performing work, and therefore is stronger. Now, while this is going on, there's also the neurologic adaptation phenomenon going in. This is where the body, again, it adapts to the strength training uh, regimen you increase or the body increases the number of motor units activated. It's basically analogous to having more, oh, say more uh, better coverage from say a cell phone is from uh, roughly going from 4G to 5G or things of that regard. So you increase the number of motor units activated you increase the synchrony which with, with which motor units are activated, so the muscle becomes more efficient as a machine. Some people have described this as, say, taking your regular car engine and putting in higher octane fuel. Chances are, even though your gas mileage may suffer a little bit, your actual performance may improve. So th these two factors work together. Now, it'll become a little bit more evident later on, just a little bit later on, that when we're talking about folks who want to focus on becoming stronger, a normal athlete becoming stronger, we're going to look at, or I shouldn't say we, but the, the process really works more from a standpoint of muscle hypertrophy. Whereas someone who has an injury or an impairment that's trying to improve their function back toward normal, it's more of a standard, or not a standard, it's more of the standpoint of neurologic adaptation. Also in the process, these two operate together, but your muscle doesn't become bigger overnight, so to speak. The pump that people get after a big workout or a long workout or a heavy workout at the gym, the muscle pump that they feel is actually increased fluid within the muscle itself. That's not the muscle getting bigger on a permanent standpoint. It's not increasing the size or the number of motor units. So the muscle does not hypertrophy. It takes a while to do that. A lot of the early gains in strength come from neurologic adaptation. The body becoming more efficient as of, of a machine to do a better job of producing force and therefore strength. Okay, try not to get too complicated as we go on here and let's just kind of keep moving forward. 
So how does a muscle increase strength? As I just met, as I just mentioned, it's the two systems working together. Uniquely enough, the neurologic adaptation system works first primarily. And the changes take place. This, I'm going to back up just a second, hopefully. The changes that take place, the increased number of motor units activated, the increased synchrony of, of motor unit activation takes place over the first six weeks of a strength training program. So if someone started from scratch, or if someone started rehab after an injury, those first six weeks of a strength program, whatever that program is, the gains that take place are accounted for by neurologic adaptation. The muscle is still starting hypertrophy, but the hypertrophication effect really doesn't kick in until the first uh, seven or so weeks of a strength program. There's a little bit of a variation person to person with age group. There's a little bit of a variation between genders, but that variation is a plus or minus two weeks or so. These sorts of things happen, at least the neurologic situation happens under what's called the SED principle. And this has been around for a long, long period of time in the exercise physiology literature, in the physical education literature, it's been in the medical, the orthopedic, you name it, it's been there. And this is the principle of specific adaptation to impose demand, SED, specific adaptation to impose demand, which is a fancy way of saying the body adapts to what you do. Your body gets better at what you're doing as you do it more. So if you train the muscle to get stronger, it's going to get stronger. It's going to adapt. And the first part of the adaptation process is neurologic. And then finally, it's the physical mechanical sort of thing of muscle hypertrophy. The way that muscle hypertrophy accomplishes itself, neurologic adaptation to step back just a second is basically just doing things repetitively. The more times you do it, the better things go, the stronger you get that way. But to a certain extent, it then peters out. It basically kind of hits maximum at about six weeks or so. To improve or to continue strengthening, you need to have the hypertrophication effect. And this occurs through progressive overload, meaning lifting a heavier weight or moving a heavier load, or challenging yourself more through a larger rope if you're doing a, a rope sort of thing, or a heavier kettlebell, or things of that regard, or a higher gradient if you're doing a running program for hill work, or these sorts of things. So the important things to realize is the first six weeks or so, the changes that occur are neurologic, and then become mechanical through muscle hypertrophication. And these factors, we kind of, well, we don't kind of, we need to keep these in mind as we help folks determine a strengthening program that's going to work for them and address their individual needs. Okay, so how does a muscle increase strength? We mentioned neurologic, we mentioned muscle hypertrophy. The neurologic adaptation is an efficiency response. The more repetitions you do of something, the better you get at it. You get an increased strength because the overall system works better. It becomes more synchronous. You get a fine tuning, so to speak. It's like a finely tuned engine is going to perform better than one that's been basically out of routine maintenance. It's been shown through motor learning that it takes like 10,000 repetitions of an activity to be for, the, for that activity to become second nature. So we're not saying, for using that as a rough analogy, we're not saying that you need 10,000 reps to become stronger. But the analogy is if you take someone such as a Tom Brady who practices and practices and practices and goes through the repetitions and goes through the repetitions it becomes understandable why he has won seven Super Bowls as a quarterback versus someone who is just basically going through the motions, so to speak.
So the neurological adaptation is an efficiency response, while muscle hypertrophy is a structural res response. The progressive overload produces strength because there's simply more muscle and a bigger muscle available to activate. So the larger muscle, more strength, you've got more uh, substrate to activate. Overall, the two work together so someone becomes stronger. So this is the underlying principles behind what strength is and how you make a muscle stronger. So let's kind of go to the next one. And this is where we need to have a little bit of a dichotomy, as I mentioned before. How does a muscle increase strength? Well, you increase strength through a strengthening program. But this is where we need to break it down. We could break it down into many, many different areas, sports-specific areas, uh, injury-specific areas. But to, at least for the purpose of this webinar, we need to differentiate between training and rehabilitation or between things that are done, done in the exercise gym or the YMCA or the health club versus things done in the physical therapy clinic or the hospital or things of that regard. And this doesn't mean that one is superior to the other. It means that people need to be cognizant of the factors involved with each. Because if you apply one to the other setting, you're not gonna be as effective. For example, if we would try to apply the strength training program needed for a marathon runner to the clinical environment for someone who's just coming in following a total knee replacement, it's not going to work very well and vice versa. If we apply the principles that we use for rehabilitation following total knee uh, replacement surgery to someone who's trying to improve their marathon time, it's not going to work pretty well. And what I'm getting at here are the famous buzzwords out there. We've all heard the saying, no pain, no gain, or go for the burn, or push for one more rep. There is nothing wrong with that in the appropriate context. If you have a healthy muscle, if you are pain-free, if you are functional and trying to get to a higher level of function, those principles may apply very, very nicely. But in the rehab setting, those sorts of things tend to increase pain, increase inflammation, and delay the recovery process. So the, re the rehab setting becomes more of a keep it comfortable versus no pain, no gain. And I'll elaborate this on this further as we go on here in just a little bit. Okay. So when we dichotomize between strength training and rehabilitation, or strength through rehabilitation, for training or for weightlifting or whatever you want to call it. I'm using the term training very generically or very generally here. In training, you want to exercise to increase strength in someone who is already healthy. The goal is to improve their normal functional abilities, to make them more efficient so they can lift more weight or run longer distance or uh, have a longer shift on their ice hockey calling or what have you. Whereas in rehabilitation, exercise is done to promote a return to normal functional ability from someone who is injured. So someone who is less than healthy, rehabilitation strengthening gets them back to normal ability. And once they return to normal ability, then they can certainly go on with a strength training regimen to get even stronger, better, and what have you. Again, the delineation standpoint is, are we healthy or are we impaired in some way? Are we recovering from injury or are we good and just trying to get better at what we're trying to accomplish as an athlete or a worker or someone who's just functioning in the real world? Now, one of the key concepts here between the two is the concept of volume. And this is a term, we're not talking about how much liquid you can put in a cylinder or something like that. The concept of volume when we talk about exercise, it's important for muscle strength in both the training standpoint and the rehabilitation standpoint. Volume is a measure of the total amount of work that's done in a strength exercise. 
Volume is also based on the time a muscle is, spends under tension during a strength exercise. The other way to look at this is, you could think of volume as the number of sets and reps, or you could think of volume as the amount of time taken. When we're talking about hypertrophy, or we're talking about strengthening from a standpoint of someone who's normal in trying to get better, stronger, the volume standpoint usually, I'm speaking in very general terms now, usually takes the form of sets and reps, repetitions and then complete sets of repetitions. Whereas if we're talking about strengthening for rehabilitation, for someone who's coming off of injury, for someone who's debilitated, someone who's trying to get to normal function, we think of volume usually from a standpoint of duration. Now they can be used interchangeably, but research has indicated that sets and reps for volume for, is a better, more efficient way of hypertrophying a muscle and helping someone get stronger assuming that they're functionally normal, meaning healthy. Whereas if someone is debilitated, ill, recovering, sets and reps work fine, but volume is a more efficient way to get the person from where they are to where they need to be. And so it's not just the number of sets, it's not just the number of reps, sometimes it's the amount of time. And we'll uh, delineate these a little bit more as we go on. And these are getting into the key components of how someone can design an exercise program or how programs can be designed efficiently to help someone meet their goals. So continuing on from the key concept of volume, when we're talking about training with volume, one of the key factors is the resistance, meaning the amount of weight itself. If someone can train with a heavier resistance, assuming that everything is structurally sound at the joints that they're using and they're not producing pain or injury, in general, the heavier weight you lift, the stronger you get. From a rehabilitation standpoint, again, this is someone who's coming from injury, debilitation, illness, or what have you. The volume is occurs through duration. The longer you can do something, again, safely, pain-free, no increase in symptoms, the longer you can do it, the stronger you become until you become functionally normal. And at that point in time, you can move over to the resistance end of things. Now, again, I'm just dichotomizing between two general concepts. We could break this down into multiple areas. And if you have, have interest in this, I'd be happy to work with you on this because it's a situation that all of these or both of these general things, we might have to take parts of each for your own individual needs. Okay, let's move on forward here again. Okay, strengthening programs in general for strength training, you're going to progressively increase the resistance to get a progressive overload by adding load, adding weight, adding mass, adding more bars, whatever you wanna say, you're adding more stuff that the muscle has to move against, has to push against, has to pull against. So training for strength, is, hopefully we haven't lost me. Hopefully I am still there. I'm seeing a blank screen. You're still here, Kent, we're good. Okay, very good, all right. I don't know why I have a blank screen. You can still hear me all right? Yes, I can. Good. Okay. Sorry for the little glitch here. So strength training or training for strengthening, we basically get a progressive increase in resistance in weight. And the way this is done in general, fewer reps with a heavier weight. Heavier weight, fewer reps, trains for strengthening. Now, the natural question to ask is, well, what if I get a heavier weight and do more reps? Well, 
Then we get into the components of maybe power and endurance. So we're going to save those sorts of factors for another webinar. When we're talking about rehabilitation strengthening or strength to help with rehabilitation, recovery from injury, this is where we're talking about through a progressive increase of duration by adding time or repetitions. In general, this becomes more reps with a lighter weight because if you start trying to do fewer reps, reps with a heavier weight, this is where you might lead to irritation of the injured area and debilitation, which prolongs the recovery process. Okay. So strengthening programs, why do we want to talk about these things? Why, we need to, why do we need to dichotomize between training and rehabilitation? Because a healthy muscle needs a heavier load to hypertrophy and to improve functional performance abilities. We mentioned that six-week time period of neurological adaptation, most athletes don't want to just do something for six weeks. It's like, well, okay, I'm going to take six weeks to prepare for a particular event, and then I'm never going to do that event again. If that's the case, it's kind of an unusual circumstance, but then we'd need to look at helping you with neurological adaptation. Most athletes, and for most people that maintain good health, it's not just six weeks. You need to keep doing something in order to promote functional performance abilities, or at least to maintain them. Now, on the other side of things, if we've got someone who's got an injured muscle, we can strengthen. It's not that we go to complete rest or absence of activity. The injured muscle needs time to heal and return to normal function. So we can actually strengthen that injured muscle with a pain-free amount of resistance, more repetitions, as opposed to a weight that might create pain or create tissue damage. In a lot of cases, that injured muscle may just need the weight of its limb. If you have a torn biceps in your upper arm, it may just be comfortable controlled motion at the elbow of flexing and extending your elbow to help with the recovery process. So let's now talk about the parameters involved here. And I hope this is still, we're just kind of drilling down here and trying to get to the more practical aspect of how to design strengthening exercises. For both training and for rehabilitation, the order of exercises does matter. The research that has been done since the 1920s in terms of laboratory studies, clinical studies, gym studies, studies on younger populations, older populations, professional sports teams, Olympic athletes, indicates that in general, you get a more efficient outcome by exercising larger muscles before smaller muscles. I'm going to take just a break here for a little bit of lubrication of the old uh, vocal cords. It's been shown that working larger muscles before stronger muscles is simply a more efficient way to get stronger. Also, doing multi-joint exercises instead of single joint exercises is also a way to get stronger more efficiently. Now, let's say there's an exception to this, certainly. If your chosen athletic pursuit is bodybuilding, then you may wish to look at single joint exercises exclusively because your goal as a bodybuilder is simply to get the muscles as big as they can be and balance so that you look appropriate when you're at a bodybuilding competition. And also regarding the order of exercises, it's been found that alternation between lower and upper body is again more efficiently. So examples of this, work the knee or the quadriceps before the elbow. Why? The knee is a bigger joint and the quadriceps are a bigger muscle than the, than the muscles that move the elbow. Look at potentially doing squats before doing bicep curls. Why? The squats are a multi-joint exercise and bicep curls are a single joint exercise. And also the squats bring in the rear end muscles, the gluteus maximus, the hamstrings, as well as the quadriceps 
instead of just the biceps and the triceps. And also the legs before the arms, because the legs tend to have larger muscles as compared to the arms. So these again are generalizations and just meant for examples. Your own individual strengthening program may take a different approach for your own individual needs. Also, in terms of some general parameters, someone who has not trained for strength, or it's been a while since they've trained for strength, the suggested frequency, and this is based upon the work that's been done by the Centers for Disease Control and Protection prevention and also the American College of Sports Medicine. The suggested frequency is two days a week. The suggested number of repetitions is eight to 12 of each exercise. This is a starting standpoint, two days a week, eight to 12 reps of each exercise. Why is this? Well, it's been found that if you try this more frequently until you get experienced, until your body adapts, you run the risk of becoming sore, unnecessarily so, and you run the risk of tendonitis and other sorts of things which would detract from, this, from the training program. You cease to be a strength trainer and you start to become someone who's injured and you need to look at rehabilitation. The more experienced individual can progress to say three to four days a week, leaving about a 48 hour break in between times, looking at repetitions of six to eight and increasing load to keep the repetitions in that area. Now, for example, let's look at the beginner standpoint. Let's say you can do an exercise of 15 repetitions, no problem. That would imply that the weight that you're using or the exercising you're using is not quite, I hesitate to use the word intense, but not quite strenuous enough to basically challenge the muscle, to challenge the body to become better. So if you can do something, say 15 repetitions, that would say, okay, let's increase the weight or change the activity so we can do things, whatever that thing is, within a range of eight to 12 repetitions. If I can do more than 12, the weight is too, too light. If I can't do eight, the weight is too heavy. So the eight to 12 zone is the sweet spot for exercise. Now for the more experienced individual, since their muscles have adapted, the hypertrophication process has started to some degree or is maybe ongoing. The neurological adaptation process has definitely taken place. This is where the sweet spot for strengthening becomes six to eight reps and you would adjust the load, the number of uh, the amount of weight being moved, the mass being pushed or whatever, to fall within that six to eight repetition range. Now, people ask, well, what if, if beyond those sorts of things, then we're talking more the, stand, the standpoint of maybe muscle power development or muscle endurance development. So that's the subject of future webinars. The other question that comes up quite frequently, well, does that mean I can only do something or do some sort of exercise two days a week or three to four days a week? That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the case. These are indications or parameters for strength specific training. This doesn't mean that you can't do aerobic training or this doesn't mean that you can't do some other sort of training or some other sort of exercise. So this is the strengthening component of an overall program to improve health and fitness. So these are the baseline parameters. These parameters may be adjusted as you work with your person who's ever helping you get stronger or recover or simply become healthier. Now, from the standard of strengthening additional parameters for the beginning, for the beginner rather, we wanna take a look at one to two sets. So that would mean one to two sets of eight to 12 exercises, pardon me, eight to 12 repetitions per exercise. One to two sets of eight to 12 repetitions each. As someone gets more experienced, then you can increase the number to two to four sets. But in that case, it would be six to eight repetitions each. 
in terms of resting for pure strength training, the beginner is going to want to take a rest period of between three to five minutes between sets. This may seem like a long period of time, but this is the way to minimize the chance of delayed onset muscle soreness, that feeling of muscles you haven't fused in a while, or that feeling the next morning after a gym workout the next day that, oh my gosh, I can't get out of bed. What have I done to myself? Whereas the experienced strength trainer can rest two to three minutes in between sets. If they rest longer as an either experienced or beginner, you lose the efficiency of the training approach. If you don't rest enough, you run the risk of injury. Or you may not be training for strength, you may be training for power or endurance. And again, those are the subjects of future webinars. So these are the parameters. Back in the slide up, again, frequency for a beginner, two days a week, eight to 12 reps, one to two sets, resting three to five minutes in between sets. For the more experienced individual, three to four days a week, giving a 48 hour break in between those training days, six to eight repetitions per load or per exercise, two to four sets, two to three minutes resting in between. So that those are the, the parameters for strength training or some people call it gym training because this is more the stereotypical working out at the YMCA or gold gym or whichever gym you wish to use. Now let's get out of or transition from or change to rehabilitation. So strengthening for rehabilitation. This is where you want to set aside the no pain, no gain that is classic from the workout regimen for high level athletes or for people who want to get stronger. And we need to keep it comfortable for folks who are debilitated or recovering from injury. Because quite frankly, the no pain, no gain approach for someone who's already injured is only gonna make things worse. We wanna to try to keep it comfortable. For the longest period of time, if someone was injured, the primary prescription was rest, meaning absence of activity. In the 1950s, 1950s, that's now 70 years ago, research first came out in the medical community, let alone the physical therapy community, that the worst thing you can do for an injury is to completely rest it. We're talking about a musculoskeletal injury. The concept back then of using exercise early on was heretical, truly heretical. But the research is clear. Controlled activity helps people get stronger, helps people recover more quickly, helps people regain health and get back to normal function. Now, we're not talking about sets and reps. This is where we get into the volume sorts of things. There are some general guidelines. The concept of doing strength training on a daily basis is somewhat, oh my gosh, because I learned way back when I work out two to three times a week. If you're in a debilitated situation and you need to get back to normalcy, it's in your best interest to do things daily or several times a day, keeping them comfortable. If they start to become uncomfortable, you're doing too much and it's time to take a rest break. Instead of the general format of say, eight to 12 reps or six to eight reps, we wanna look at a standard of more like a time on tension and a rest period. The general format is doing something or contracting your muscles for 10 seconds. It could be a hold, it could be a repetition, it could be whatever. So it's a 10 second action followed by a 10 second rest period. Now people naturally shorten the rest period because they wanna get the exercise over and done with. We're so used to doing things fast that sometimes we lose sight of how the body actually works. That 10 second rest period gives the muscle and the tissues a chance to recover which decreases the chance of injury, fatigue, and helps to promote strengthening. So this is where we look at 
uh, duration instead of repetitions. The traditional gym-based situation of doing three sets of 10 versus let's do things for maybe five to six minutes at a time and then repeat that across the course of the day. So if we take a look at something in terms of repetition for training, for strengthening, for volume, the, the standard becomes maybe what we call a 10 by 10. Trying to do a 10 second hold followed by a 10 second rest period. Trying to do, if you want to do this as repetitions based, it would be as many repetitions as are comfortable. I'm going to try to do 10 reps, hold each rep for 10 seconds, rest for 10 seconds. So 10 second hold, 10 second rest 10 times. And then build from that toward as many repetitions as you feel comfortable doing. If you'd rather pursue something from a pure duration standpoint, let's do something with a 10 second hold, followed by a 10 second rest, but then try that repeated for a time of five minutes versus counting number of repetitions. Both of these work and if applied appropriately and, kept, and if things are kept comfortable, this will help someone get stronger, less painful and return toward normal function. So basically what we have here, what we attempted to do is present the general principles for improving muscle strength from a pure strengthening standpoint for training and a strengthening standpoint for rehabilitation. To review just a little bit, again, from the strengthening training standpoint, a healthy muscle needs a heavier load, an injured muscle needs more time on tension. The order of exercises is important for both sides of things, for both training and rehabilitation. We want to work larger muscles before smaller muscles. We want to look at multi-joint exercises before single joint exercises. We want to alternate between the lower body and the upper body. For pure strength training, weight lifting for lack of a better term, the beginner is going to start two days a week, eight to 12 repetitions of each exercise and build up toward three to four days a week, 48 hours rest in between training sessions, six to eight repetitions, varying the load. If you're a beginner and you can't do eight, the load's too heavy. If you're a beginner and can do more than 12, the load is too light. If you're experienced and you can't do six reps, the load is too heavy. If you are experienced and you can do more than eight, the load is too light. Now, this is purely for strength training. If you're talking about trying to develop other aspects of your muscle performance, there will be different parameters that we'll talk about in future webinars. Again, for strength training, parameters for the beginner, one to two sets, resting three to five minutes between sets. For the more experienced individual, two to four sets, resting two to three minutes in between sets. And this is based upon the current literature. But then if we're talking about recovery from injury, getting back to normal function, we want to keep it comfortable. Doing things on a daily basis or several times a day. The format of a 10 second hold followed by a 10 second rest and then doing repetitions or doing duration. If you want to count repetitions, try as many repetitions as are comfortable. Start with 10, but build up from there. Hold each one for 10, rest each one for 10 seconds, and then try starting with 10 and build up from 10 reps. If you'd rather not count repetitions, hold for 10, rest for 10, try starting with five minutes and build up from there. The idea is progression will help you get back toward normal function. So today, these were the general principles. Now, individual programs, specific programs, when we say specific programs, we're talking maybe for different sports versus individuals for individual athletes. They can be developed through a physician referral to any of our clinics, any of our clinicians 
can are certainly capable of helping someone design resistance training programs, strengthening programs for recovery from injury or to promote a higher level of health and wellness. And the easiest way to do this in terms of getting it paid for is with a physician referral to any of our clinics or other methods as well. And we can certainly talk about those on an individual basis. And it doesn't have to be just here at Bay Road with the Bay Road staff and myself. We have now expanded through a huge part of the Great Lakes Bay region from Tawas to Aw Gray to Cairo to Frankenmuth, Bridgeport, Shields, Saginaw Township, State Street, Midland, Freeland, Bay City. We have clinics all over the Great Lakes Bay region staffed by folks who are very capable and very willing to help people meet with their individual goals and help to maintain or promote health and wellness. So at this point in time, we'll open it up for questions. I'll come back to this for just a moment because after the question and answer session or after today, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have thoughts and criticism or just wanna talk about something, please feel free to get a hold of me. You can send me an email at, to ktim at renewpt.com. You can call the office at 989-401-5282. You could send a fax if you'd like to do that. The bottom line is I'm available. I'm happy to help. We're here to help. And we wanna make this worthwhile because promoting health and wellness, promoting healthy athletic competition, promoting health and recovery after injury is in everyone's best interest. So with that, I'll try to answer any questions that there may be out there. Thank you, Kent. Um, we do have a few questions. I think um, our questions are from people who are actually here with us live too. Um, okay. And it looks like we've got some runners in the group. So I know you're the right person to answer those for everybody that's here. Kent is a very involved runner. Um, regularly, he's got some races scheduled. He's done marathons in the past, so he knows what he's talking about um, for running. Um, the first one was, how often should you work on leg strength when training for a marathon? And how many days or what frequency works best for legs in that okay, case? That's a, that is a great question. When we're talking about training for a marathon, we need to bring in factors of really all three components. Because to get you through 26 miles, 385 yards, injury-free with a performance that you're happy with. There are a lot of factors that come into play. Primarily for marathon runners, the aerobic component, the endurance component is the most important factor because you can't go that long, that far without a healthy cardiovascular function. We'll talk about those components in the endurance webinar. But for the purpose of trying to answer the question here today, a marathon runner needs to take a look at their actual running schedule. So the circumstances are, that's gonna be your foundation. Are you training daily? Are you training two or three days a week? How are you training? The current research that's out there from the experts who've got more knowledge than I do, suggests that you have at least one pure rest day if you're trying to run a marathon without the risk of injury. And that means just simply a day off. Now that can be very, you know, very, very freakish to someone who's going through that. And I've gone through it myself. In other words, I'm supposed to have a rest day today. And it's like, you know, you're kind of all wound up. It's like, what am I going to do now that I can't, you know, lift the weight or go out and run or whatever else. So in general, you want to have one day as a rest day. And that is usually the day after your long run day. So that takes out two of the seven days in the week, one rest day and one is your long run day. Now, depending upon your training schedule, you may then have two or three more days a week for non-running or for other sorts of things. In that circumstance, and we're talking in general sorts of things. And this is where it gets difficult because I could say something very general, but it may not meet your individual needs. And so that's why some, or at least a lot of specialization may be necessary. But in general, 
There is nothing wrong, there is nothing counterproductive with, quote, doing legs or exercising your legs one or two days a week. Three days a week is probably going to get a little excessive for the demands of a marathon. If you're talking a 5K or a 10K, maybe not. But if you're talking a marathon or even a half marathon, one or two days of strengthening exercises for your legs is sufficient. Or if you're interested and come back for the power presentation, you may want to do one day of pure strength and one day of power development. And overall, that will help meet your needs. So hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, or if you'd like more information, get a hold of me and I'll do what I can to help. Thank you, Kent. Um, and for anybody who still does have questions, feel free to still put them in the Q&A box if you have them and Kent will answer. Um, the next question we had, um, somebody said the treadmill isn't the same as running outside. What training do you suggest for long distance running with frigid temps? Okay. I, this is where I could say something facetious about living in the southern part of the United States, but with goodness gracious, what Texas has experienced, nobody wants to go there. I train on a treadmill myself. Training for long distances in Michigan because of the winter is certainly a challenge. Treadmill running is different than running outside. And with COVID, it, you know, a lot of the indoor facilities are limited or training with a mask for a long distance is certainly not the most happy experience. What you can do with a treadmill is increase the elevation by one or two degrees. Even though running on, a, on an outdoor surface tends to be flat, it's not 100% flat, but the, the research that's been done biomechanically shows that if you increase the elevation from zero to either one or two, that simulates very closely what happens out there on the track or on the road or on the sidewalk or running outside. So that can be effective. So what I basically am doing myself, and today was not a run day for me, it's, it's a strength day for me. Yesterday was a run day for me on the treadmill. I basically did the equivalent of a 5K on my treadmill at home running at four miles an hour, which is a little bit slower, but it's a training sort of thing. And uh, with my treadmill at one degree elevation, and I did that for 30 minutes. So, so that's an example. So the big thing with the treadmill, it's not as good as the real world, but it can be helpful, it can be useful, and one to two degrees of elevation can best simulate the outdoor running environment. Um, for people who do want to do outdoor running in the cold, do you have any specific injury prevention tips or anything for them if they are going to go ahead and get outside? Great question. Now, speaking from, a, from my own personal experience, but also from the experience of someone who sees runners in terms of people who are referred to us after injury, the biggest problem out there is you're not 100% sure about what to expect. On a day like today where it's, goodness, close to 40, okay, the sidewalks, the roads are a little bit wet. There's not so much slush or what have you. The big problem comes in when it's below freezing and the sidewalks haven't been shoveled or the roads haven't been shoveled. You've got slush. And so you don't know, is there snow? Is there snow and ice? So what you're going to want to do primarily from an injury prevention standpoint is you're going to want to slow down. And because the faster you go, the less chance you have or the less time you have to react if indeed you start to slip and fall. And so you're going to want to slow down. And that's difficult for a lot of serious runners. So it may be a circumstance where it becomes better than nothing, but it's very frustrating to go slower than usual and also maybe run, walk a little bit more. The other sort of thing is we sometimes lose sight of the fact that when you run, and train seriously, you can generate a whole lot of heat. So we get problems of people who end up, <coughs> excuse me, even though it could be very, very cold outside, they end up dehydrating themselves because they overheat and essentially basically become overheated and run the risk of a thermal injury of all things. So, and this takes some trial and error to find the right 
amount of layering that you can do to keep yourself protected. So you don't want to get frostbite, nor do you want to end up with a heat illness because you have put on too many layers. It's a frustrating thing. It takes a lot of trial and error, and it just takes a lot of experimentation. Great, thank you, Kent, that's very helpful. Um, I think that's all we have for questions. Um, I will let everybody know that if you registered for this webinar through Zoom, you'll be receiving a follow-up email that has Kent's contact information right there. It'll have some top takeaways from the webinar and also information on his other two upcoming webinars. But other than that, thanks, Kent, this was great. And one other thing for the people who are participating, whether or not you want to, we appreciate the feedback, we really do, because it's a standard that we're doing this not to try to necessarily drum up business, although that's certainly a component of anything in this day and age, but we're trying to get information out there that is helpful and useful. That being said, if people have ideas, please let us know and we'll try to develop a webinar. If you have some ideas that are completely contrary to what's prevent, presented, let's hear about it so we can basically provide the people in this part of Michigan with information that's going to be of help. That's the motivation and that's why we do these things. Wonderful. Thank you, Kent. You're the ultimate educator and ultimate student at the same time. So we appreciate you. Thank you. I try. That's all I can do. <laughs> Thanks, Kent. Thanks everybody okay. for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.